Everyone should consider again. You should be continually. The easy, or the simplistic way to put it is for a person to continue trying to remember why they got involved with this, what they thought they were looking for. Most of you have now been here long enough that if you look back, you'll have some immediate sensation that whatever it was you thought you were looking for, you had forgotten the kind of verbal formation that you had. That if you try and compare what you thought you were getting into, what you thought you were looking for, compared to what has been going on, there's almost no verbal relationship. In other words, you could take the original verbal idea of what you thought you were looking for, and you could say that this has been an unconditional failure. <laughs> that it has not been involved with anything resembling what you thought you were after. And it's not because that you in some way were singularly misled. But the, on several occasions I have asked you this kind of rhetorical question about trying to neuralize yourself what people are getting or what they believe they're getting out of religion and me even pointing out the kinds of religion that have always been available. I mean, it obviously, in appearance, it varies from time to time and place to place, and the appearance of it is not misleading. Those of you that can remember and begin to understand that things are as they appear. But what is it that people expect from, and let me just say religion, and we'll lump this into it, that is, religion being everything as opposed to the rest of the run of human endeavors from art, politics, economics, sports, social relationships. That if there is something that transcends what seems to be the information ordinarily available, the kind of experience out in life, then let us, just for tonight, lump that all under religion, either with a capital R or a small r, whichever one would distinguish it today. But what is it that people are looking for? Uh, you should still notice that there are religions available already in practice, already structured for the miners. There's religions made for the blue level of the corporate body of man. And there are attempted religions almost up for the managerial level, at least for the managerial level to be assured that they are God's little chosen people and that they don't have to put up with the other crap that the miners do and that they don't have to suffer and that they don't have to put up with guilt over being rich and being in charge. But there are aspects of my, what I mean by religion tonight, available, feeding every possible type of consciousness on this planet. But again, you people should go back. I may make it a task before the night's over. I've had you do it before. But it's to ask yourself and to try and neuralize it, to try and get some understanding of what is it. And you can try and divide it up yourself if you want to. But what is it that people go out to all forms of religion, whether it be this or civil mind control, or people that believe they're involved with some Atlanta Sufi dancing group, all being religion, not excluding the organized religions. What is it that they are looking for? And what is it that they apparently receive to some small degree by their continued participation in it. And by now, for you to learn anything from this, you cannot accept your own voice's immediate answer as they want to find God. The day has almost come, at least in this part of the world, that you would be hard pressed to get people to even say that. Were they walking out of a temple or a Methodist church, especially a civil mind control or some apparent psychological self-help group. But even people walking out of church now, if you grabbed them and said you were doing a survey and asked, what is the reason you are in church? Why do you attend church? You would almost have to put words in people's mouth to get many of them to say something like, I am here to try and get in touch with the uh, divine creator of all of this. You would have much more verbally, up-to-date, contemporary answers that would sound more psychological. 
It would sound almost apropos for people talking in a singles bar, trying to pick one another up. And yet it is still quite real that there are still wars being waged and the religion itself is serving an absolutely inescapable purpose throughout this planet at all times. But now back to the question of this getting beyond me standing here and dealing with you personally and collectively. What is it that people are expecting from religion? And you should be able to learn something to try it again. We haven't done this in two or three months. Plus all I've got to do is change the words a little bit. Some of you who hadn't caught on to this trick, I can ask in a sense, the same question that I asked several months ago and simply put in a new word and apparently it can click and set up a new series of associations that you may believe that you saw something now, although it seems to be the same question that you did not see, that you did not think about two or three months ago. I mentioned last week that although I continue to point out that life does not go in a straight line, that it does not grow in that manner, I ask you the musical question, or I pointed out the possibility that life might be going in what would amount to a straight line in another dimension, but that it always seems at the very best ambiguous, uh, ambiguous, ambiguous, <laughs> If you're trying to look at, let us say, the fourth dimension with three-dimensional consciousness, and so that that could appear to be very dispecific, that could appear to be fragmented, that could appear to be going in conflicting directions might be doing otherwise if you could see from a different perspective. Some of you should be able in some way on your own, whether you use my present words or not, to be able to stratigraph, at least in a fleeting moment, a kind of map wherein you could almost get a glimpse of things apparently here being fragmented. Let us say that apparently all of my talk and diagrams and tasks and tricks already have some portion of your consciousness that would immediately agree that things are indeed splintered, fragmented, apparently contradictory in the way in which they operate, and yet I can agree with what he says that from a certain viewpoint there is no doubt that things are expanding, that things are not falling apart. But you can almost, some of you should be able to almost get a glimpse that all of this that appears to be disjointed and fragmented that if you change your perspective of it, without me drawing up my own immediate picturization of changing the horizon, of changing where you are in relationship to that which you're attempting to perceive, that 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 would appear to be in pieces, it would appear to be disconnected, it would appear to be going, at the very least, in a non-linear manner, from another viewpoint, might be going in a quite precise manner. See if you can fit this example of me taking it from life again. It has been noted of late, and it happened to come to my attention, in the wonderful world of automobile racing, a field in which I know we all share a common interest. It's having to do with what is described as G-forces primarily. That they are now able to build automobiles, race cars, that will go much faster than they could only two years ago. Major breakthroughs relatively speaking. But they can now almost build a car that many people dreamed of that will go so fast that a mortal cannot bear to drive it. <laughs> that, the, <laughs> that 
that the absolute g-forces are reaching the point now that they can build a car but that under almost any condition that they can physically construct inside the body of the vehicle that the g-forces the so-called laws of physics themselves are such that it's getting to the point that it's almost impossible for a man to keep his vision that it reaches a certain speed in a land-based vehicle. The gravitational pull of going into curves. We're talking about some form of a race track now, not just a straight line, but it would be similar after a certain point in a straight line. But that physically, now they can build a car, but also physically, the human body cannot stand to drive it, cannot drive it. Does anybody see any connection between that and the apparent disconnected, the apparent internal struggle that I have assured you that some of you begin to feel for yourself that is taking place but in a continuing creative, positive, any good word you can choose, and then once you understand, of course, the words are no good. But it is expanding in that manner. And yet inside the body of life seems to be a continual creaking, moaning, sickness, death. The good guys seem to get overrun continually by the bad guys. Whatever this kind of sea wind is seems to blow only spasmodically. And we seem to get evil winds from the west. The witches and the demons, those in charge of establishing and holding on to their own status, all of that which is outdated, all of that which is now regressive in nature, seems continually on the point of overtaking everything. That in the midst of that is life over here through man building cars faster than they thought they could build them. And that technically the car will operate on the racetrack but now one part of man, that is one part of life, can now design and construct the car, but now the very people who constructed it are not up to driving it. See if you can find any connection between this. This is something that continually goes on. It is not a new phenomenon. And this is also related to my first question to you about what do people get from religion? To see how disjointed I can make this. Is everyone by now aware that life continually through man drives man in what is nowadays fashionably referred to as liberation movements? And it does it in apparently quite specific areas such as political, economic. It's going on all over the world in areas that seem to be more stable. And remember this is both specific and non-specific that I'm, which I'm using this kind of life produced example. That it always seems to be in quite specific areas and even in parts of the world that seem to be more stable. That is, parts of the body of life on this planet, through this planet. To wit, us. That there is continual talk of some kind of revolution. That things have gone so far in one direction that something must be done to some disenfranchised group of people or the economic distribution must be realigned. But in other parts of the world, as all of you, I assume, know, it's far beyond talk that they're out fighting in the streets. And it's always been going on. But at the ordinary level, it is always apparently in regards to very specific areas. But it's always either revolution or talk of revolution going on. But now you realize this, that it always seems to be driving men, and they can identify it. They're forced to identify that this liberation movement 
has a very specific aim. Here is what we are attempting to do. It is in that way in as much as a kind of omnidirectional mortal freedom is impossible. And so man is left at that level with a kind of verbal equation that I could make as being apparently small battles equaling small spoils of war. That the apparent payoff is not only very specific, but it's very small. Now, regardless of the fact that it does not seem the way, as far as they put it, to the people involved, that what we're trying to do is not small. What we're trying to do is overthrow this whole tyrannical government that's rotten from top to bottom. And so from their mortal individual viewpoint, it is not a small spoil that they're after. And yet as opposed to some kind of non-specific freedom, it is small. All right, how about back to even my first comment before asking you about religion was asking you, can you recall verbally what your own voice has told you that this must be or what you thought you were looking for? It is always, in some form, an attempted liberation movement. As people, oft times not being able to express it in this area, that I am seeking some kind of additional freedom. All the way from one of the classic examples, verbally being humanity in certain segments, saying there is something great, there is something potentially great stirring in me. I have something to give to life. I have something to say, to play my guitar, to paint a picture, to write a book. I have something great to say, and I'm just not sure, quite sure what it is. But as John Lee Hooker, that great philosopher, used to say, it's in him and it's got to come out. That's the way people have expressed it throughout the ages. Now, in regards to religion and this kind of liberation movement, can you also see that all three departments in the corporate body of human life, this feeling that's in me and it's got to come out if I can find it, can operate and be quite active and can be specifically identified, can be seen at all three levels. And you do not have to look outside this room because I got enough questions specifically tonight that if any of you can hear, I didn't necessarily bring those questions to use. But there are people who feel like there is something in me, and some of you would still be wanting to put it on an emotional level. And I would hint to some of you, look a little bit lower than that to start with. All right, I'll get cruder. You get down in the mines, you get down on the red level, where we do not have people inclined to sit around after work or on break and discuss Plato or you know, the latest messages coming from the Vatican. They're feeling that there's something in me that's got to come out. Could anybody perceive the fact that it can be, in a sense, no more than sexual? It's in me and it's got to come out. I just can't seem to find the right kind of satisfaction. I just hadn't found the right kind of woman yet. Or I'm just a rambling, crazy kind of guy, and I can't be tied down, and something happens, I just can't get in a kind of relationship that absolutely fulfills me, and yet there's some kind of yearning in me. He needs to listen to John Lee Hooker, get to that line that it's in him and it's got to come out. But how can you find liberation? How can any movement know that they have succeeded in their attempt, that is, that I want to be free? 
All right, fine. Free from what? Uh, uh, where can you go with that? But how many of you, even though you by no means were using such words to yourself when you first thought you were searching for some kind of great secret activity, it was an attempt to undertake some kind of liberation movement. And at that time, had I grabbed you when you first came in and said, all right, this has to do with a kind of invisible, unknown liberation movement. That's what I'm leading. And let's say that all of you went, okay, yeah, I can sort of fit that in. And I said, all right, I got to know one thing to start with before I can deal with you personally somewhere down the road. What is it that you want to be free from? Now, before you laugh too quickly, my suggestion is that a greater majority of you then would have said, ah, okay, it's this, then could now. <laughs> Not because you were wrong, but because now you're feeling of what you want to be free from, you'd already forgotten that by now. Yeah. Or now you have some understanding that, well, that wasn't even the right area. <laughs> I was listening to the wrong voice. Or that is now so connected to something else I see that uh, it's not even, just forget it. I was wrong. I just didn't understand the problem correctly. But the feeling that it's in me and it's got to come out, which I'm suggesting to you as a expression of those at least wanting to erect the barricades and guy in the streets and become liberated from something, if you do not know put it crudely, who the enemy is, if you do not know who the oppressor is, if you do not know what seems to be your captor, then I assure you it is most difficult to know when you turn to the others in the trenches, are we succeeding? Well, I don't know. There's a lot of blood, a lot of people are bruised. But are we succeeding? Well, I don't know, but what the hell, we're doing something. But then how many can remember the last time I pointed out to you that that which appears to be the enemy in the beginning is not the enemy? Which the once or twice that I have dwelled upon that for some minutes, many, 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 many of you when I, you and I warned some of you, had voices that would accept it immediately as being some form of psychoanalysis of simply saying, look, you're not as bad off as you thought. It's not your fault. So even with that caveat, it's still the fact that what seems to be the enemy, that which seems to be to those who think they can identify the enemy, that here is my problem, that's never the enemy. And so you can struggle forever. And then I could refer you to that second great American philosopher, Joel Chandler Harris, in the story of the Tar Baby. And all you got to do is fight a Tar Baby, and the more you fight, to say the very least, the less you're capable of walking away unscarred. But there is always a sensation, well, I'm doing something. I am whipping the shit out of this thing. <laughs> I am not taking any more crap off my enemy. And by the tar baby, do I have to point out that the reigning tar baby everywhere is every person's sense of I, that that is the tar baby. And when it gets down to it, that is everyone's tar baby. That yeah, apparently I am having some conflict with not I. There is some out there, but take someone and set them down. Those dealing with the general realm of greater reality in their time and place. And they would finally say, whether it came out in pseudo-religious terms or pseudo-psychological terms, that all right, the real problem, I know it's not out there. It's me. I am the tar baby. And as soon as I can find out how to attack it, as soon as I can get a little more information, 
I mean, as soon as I can find someone else to sh point out some more of my shortcomings. I study them all the time. Uh, I am very objective and hard on myself. I'm very introspective. I worry continually about how I look, the way, the impression I have on other people. I worry about these horrible daydreams, these unspeakable thoughts and feelings I have about other people. Uh, I'm sure that's not all, though, because the ones I know, if that was all of it, surely I'd be in better shape. Because a lot of this, I am sure, is subconscious. A lot of this is hidden from me. There are tar babies within tar babies. <laughs> well, the problem is, as I am telling you, you've got the wrong enemy, you're using the wrong ammunition, and there is no way to tell if you're getting freed from it. The only sensation is that there is some activity going on. At least I'm not sitting around staring at my navel or the TV set. That I'm apparently involved with a definite struggle. <laughs> Let me tell you about another tar baby. Back to auto racing. These racing machines that they now have, to which I refer, that go faster than men can almost bear to drive them. I also read that due to the great physical forces reaching these land speeds now, that there is no way to take the human body, these drivers, and to simply put them in a seat and strap them in, no matter how many seat and shoulder harnesses they use that to push it beyond that kind of now unusable technology is, is for each driver, they take a form of this foam spray. And they have him squat down, and they just spray it all over his backside, and he has to get in a position that seems to be the most bearable to get in one position and hold on to this sucker. And so each one is just custom made, and then it is wrapped around him as much as he can stand and they still, of course, can't go past a certain speed. They just cannot keep control. They can't keep their senses. They can't keep their eyeballs in their head. <laughs> but can anyone see that a personally formed foam seat, <laughs> in a sense, is a not eye tar baby? <laughs> yes, this is comfortable while I sit here. But then it gets up 265 miles an hour on a curve. And it's, it's not a question of being comfortable. It's a question, this is not usable. And it's the best that can be done. So, seeing that obviously everyone sees a connection, <laughs> would that be the final, if it could happen, answer to one who got religion, one who got successfully analyzed? to be able to walk out of the church, walk out of the office and say, hey, at high speed this don't work, what's the best you can do? <laughs> Past a certain point this is unbearable, but hey, sitting here right now, it ain't bad. <laughs> All right. For a few minutes back to MV12 in the blood. Some of you really jumped on Several things I do not predict beforehand, but just so you'll know that I can be pleased. I was pleased to see that some of you immediately began to have questions along a certain line. So a couple of them I'm going to mention. One is let me refer you back to the fact that under all ordinary conditions, humanity transfers transforms a quite crude level of energy. That's simply the way things are. And I could go on for a long time about this and get some of you around the corner. In a sense, I'll just throw into you, if you understand that, you understand almost 90% of everything going on. Once you personally understand that things are arranged, not good and evil, not misarranged, Things are properly arranged so that men ordinarily
transform and transfer a quiet crude level of energy. It is the minimal amount to keep life going. Now this substance that I finally gave you a name for had several questions that jumped on sex and laughter. And I did not bring the questions to read because it was enough that somebody, several people even, had questions in that area. So I will just make a couple of sketches in general around the area that some people are already smelling. You could say that there is a connection between sex and the way in which this substance is used. Now the obvious one that some of you should realize is again back to the absolute minimal level at which humanity can operate as a whole to help life grow, and that is in reproducing the race. No proper fucking, no more people. But then you get into the areas that almost everybody sitting here has voice is still talking to you to which you pay passing attention that in some way I'm not doing sex right. <laughs> you know, sometimes it seems like I do it right and it seems like, boy, this is okay. You know, this is better than sliced bread and at other times you feel like, you know, I don't know, uh, it's not as good as it used to be or it's not as good with somebody else I used to have sex with. I don't know what it is. At the minimal level, we're talking about ordinary people, ordinary consciousness, there is no way to do sex wrong. Now that includes those reproducing that might say, listen, something is wrong with me sexually because I hear about the sexual revolution, I read all these wonderful articles, and to me, you know, that's just no big deal. So something is wrong with me personally. But please note, as strong and as interesting as at least a popular subject for people's imagination and our speech is concerned, as sex is, it is really not outside the same limitations, the same confines that I have pointed out to you that everything is just right, including people feeling like that everything is not right. Just sex, it would appear because of partially the purpose it serves and it being right at ground level with keeping life going, that any feeling of being dissatisfied about sex is in some way very suspect. Now, if you're ordinary, it's not. But the little bit I was going to sketch for you people beginning to ask some of the questions about it is you could look at it. Remember, this is not the ordinary view. We're talking about you now is you could see in a certain way that while sex itself has a direct connection to AMV12, that it's going to get partially used up there. In other words, the blood is going to get altered through sex. It's then for you to neuralize, for you to try and investigate that there is a difference that there is a possibility that the substance could be increased, that is, less of it used for minimal purposes, or it can be, remember I'm talking to you now, wasted, that is, you use more of the substance than is necessary. At least that sound too obtuse. I'll refer you back to a very simple clarification once you're not absolutely ordinary, when sex feels right, you're doing it the first way. When it doesn't feel like it was right, you're in the latter camp I just mentioned. Now I know that that is not some of the questions that some of you had in mind, because the questions always come up very simply, which they're supposed to. 
but like, what can I do about it? You've got to have some personal awareness that this situation exists, and it is not, it is not, it is not some sort of psychological problem you have. If there is any great difference between you and the norm at this time and place of sexual activity or sexual interest, it is molecular, it is biochemical, it is not psychological. So first you have got to have an awareness, and you've got to have an awareness on the basis, not that I seem to enjoy sex less than everybody else says they do. Now, of course, they could be exaggerating. <laughs> I'm not saying that everybody is, but some people could be, let's face it. But at any rate, you have this voice that says, I do not enjoy sex. I don't seem to get out of sex what everybody else says they get out of it. Taking into account that everybody else may be exaggerating, or some of them may be, you still cannot operate. You will not get anywhere, as you should have some awareness by now, on the basis that this is a personal psychological problem of mine. If your sex drive, and therefore somewhere tied to what you call enjoyment, is less than the norm of even other people in this group, it is not psychological. You can feel it in a certain way, and I'm not by any means going to run any great risk of encouraging strange daydreams. But I will point out one more thing that perhaps all of you have never heard me say directly. There is something wrong. I'm talking to you people, not to life. If we were open the public church, I'll have to find another way to tell them. It'll take me all of two or three seconds, but it wouldn't be this way. But something is wrong if you get through screwing and you don't feel better for it. Then you should not have done it right then. Either speaking in time or place. If you get through fucking and you don't feel better for it, and if you don't feel like the person you just had sex with is probably as good a person as ever walked this planet. And there's no reason to believe that. I don't mean any discussion. <laughs> just you get through and you look at the other person, or just peek at them, or just the way they're laying there, and as far as you're concerned, you could not ask, or you don't know where there's a better human alive right now. And you can't prove it, you can't defend it, and as I said, you shouldn't even really be thinking about it in words, but just like, that you like turn around and just punch her or him on the arm, like. <laughs> if, it's, if it's not that, if it's not that, then more of Van V12 is being spent at minimal levels in sex than is necessary for you, and it is not profitable at those times. The second area that came up, which, as I said, should have, there was a sitting duck, I guess, for some of you, since I had previously referred back to the bridge points, was laughter. Very quick, let me point out that there are verbally parallels between that and sex. Laughter, the, to you people right now, that sometimes feels all right. Yes. And at times, you catch yourself laughing at somebody else's joke or as you made a comment, and as soon as you get through with it, it feels like, yes. but that was not funny. Yes. Laughter has a connection to the blood. And although for a long time I continued to use that term hostility, this kind of web of hostility, and I kept telling you that wasn't the word, that there was no word for it, but this kind of tension that is the healthy tenor of the grid of life, this kind of apparent harmless joking going on between sexual partners, between friends, between family, people laughing at each other's weight, 
people laughing at each other's hardship and then saying, well, you know, I don't mean it. He's a good friend of mine, but that's the third car he, he's bought in the last six months. He goes out and buys them for 75 bucks, and everybody knows it's going to fall apart. He's just so cheap, and so we make jokes, but hell, he's, you know, he's my best friend. Well, he's my brother. I don't mean it personally. But all of you on a good day by now, without just my absolute rule, I am just going to operate on the basis of believing that on a good day, you people do have some awareness that that is not funny. And yet there are other times you can laugh and it happens out in ordinary life, then we have to put it in the realm of those kind of imprecise cosmic accidents. But ordinary people do have the experience at times of laughing and it seems very refreshing. It feels, like, it feels as though it were a worthwhile endeavor. And there was no feeling of, I wish I could scrape my tongue off, I wish I could take this laugh back. Similar to what I mentioned, there is a way in which you can look at it as expending more of that substance, but it's the kind of laughter that I have referred to as hostile. But you should be past the point now of trying to argue with me or arguing with that word hostile. You should be able to feel by now that there are things that are not funny. And it's not because of the things just per se, it's not just within themselves, but you hear something. Your whole molecular structure arranges what you heard. You understand that that was a, an attempt at humor. You're also aware of the fact that my hardwired consciousness will arrange itself right now. The tiger, everyone else is ready to laugh. I can laugh at that, but that is not funny. If I laugh at that, I am wasting something, and you are. You're not offending the gods, but you're wasting something. You're expending more of Vam V12 going into laughter, which serves a purpose at the ordinary level, but you're expending more than is profitable. I've got a couple of short ones before I, what do ministers call it? The main subject for the evening? Why do I keep asking you people? Periodic questions come up regarding this, and I haven't responded to it in several years. And those of you who asked the questions, if it was indeed a well-formed question from you, you should be able to now spot that I am finally responding to your question. It's that everyone wears costumes, and I've had you people ask questions that had to do more specifically. You know, you've asked questions all the way from, uh, you know, does it matter what kind of car I drive? Uh, should I have my hair redone? Is that a form of weakness for me to consider having plastic surgery to my nose? All, right. all of you being wired up to be able to understand everyone else, you are aware of the fact that throughout all religions, in the full sense of that word, has been this common thread of blandness but that in some way we should be able to turn ourselves over to the gods, to greater forces, and be bland. Yeah. Uh, we, will all, we will all go without bathing. Uh, well, it's normally expressed in the West, and they have their form of it in the East, that it's some kind of ego denial. That, you know, there is some kind of man, back to those old stories that are prevalent everywhere, that there is some part of man that is alien to this external god or gods. And this part, and this bad part, the carnal part, the evil part, anything that it's up to, you know, the big guy ain't gonna like. Showing off, you know, having your nose straightened out, uh, saving up and buying a new Corvette, that, you know, a good blank, fill in your know, Christian, Buddhist, Jew, follower of Swami X, a good blank would not do such things, right? 
You know, if you had any extra money, you'd give it to the Swami or you'd give it to the church, but you would not waste it on things that in some way would distinguish you. Like everything else, there is validity to that. That is a reflection of reality. <coughs> but everyone is wearing a costume of some kind. <coughs> the difference is this. Once you get past the, any kind of form of attempted mechanical alliance to mechanically based structures, that is that, again, I assume all of you know that uh, almost all religions, at least some of the cults within religions, the schisms out of religions, get down to the point that everyone should wear a hat at all times. Everyone should only wear black clothes, black suits, black dresses. Uh, everyone should keep their hair shaved, their head shaved, men and women. Uh, nobody should wear jewelry. Uh, if we're going to drive cars, everyone should, uh, er, we'll all get together and everybody will buy a 68 black Dodge Duster <laughs> with, a, with, with a, a slant six. I point out again, this is, it's only funny because it's a reflection of something real, but it's like externally trying to be humble and then beginning to be very proud of yourself that, you know, I'm probably one of the more humble people, at least in this part of the country. I'm, that's one of the few things I'm proud of is how humble I am. It gets to be within this kind of circular snare for someone attempting to break out of it, for someone attempting to be part of a liberation movement, it becomes self-defeating. Now, at the ordinary level, it is serving a purpose or it would not be going on, right? Amen. People would still not be doing that all over the world. Educated, sophisticated people. At least paying lip service. Talking about the action, whether they do it or not. Approving of it verbally. That yes, I know that I should be, live a more humble, a more upright, a more bland life. That I, I'm just sure in some way this offends, in some way this offends the gods. And it does get to the level, as again, all of you know, that they're, Nowadays they're called cults, but at one time they were physical manifestations of this were not looked on with such suspicion in the world. But you, but put today you know there are cults that everybody dresses alike. Now, no one there's a, externally, no form of a hierarchy showing. Everybody wears the same kind of robe. Everybody shaves their head. Everyone lives in a communal situation. Nobody has a car, or if anybody has a car, they all got the same kind of car. Everybody goes barefooted, everybody has the same kind of little 99 cent sandals from Kmart. That there is a kind of uniformity. That we're showing our humility, uh, we're showing our subservience to the higher forces, we're showing that we're all brothers and sisters in this. But everyone is wearing a costume. If you went around naked, you're in costume. The difference is whether you understand it or not. And then I refer you back to understanding what understanding is. That if you understand something, it is not hostile, it is not defensive, and it's n by any means it's not captious. That you may have the costume, but the costume does not have you. And anybody who asks about a costume, well, how do you know whether a costume has you? Do you care whether you drive up to the party in the old beat up 68 bug when your new Corvette's in the shop. Does that ruin the evening? Or that you're ready to go out to the opera or to see Waylon Jennings? And that dress that you had planned on wearing, you just, you'd planned on it, it just, it was a much a certainty that you were going to wear that dress as it was you were going to get up and go that evening. And you look in the closet 30 minutes before it's time to leave and realize there's this huge green spot covering it. So it's impossible. You can't wear the dress. Does that make a discernible difference? And it does not have to be just the action of it, back to thinking about the action of it. So wait a minute, I don't have that dress. Or wait a minute, they promised my new Corvette would be out by 5 o'clock so I could take it. 
and now I'm faced, I'm going to have to drive that $250 VW. And it makes, there's nobody to explain it to, there's nobody to defend it to, there's no way to rationalize it. It's the awareness that the costume's got me. I don't have the costume. I don't own the dress. Under this condition right now, the dress owns me. The car owns me. This is not a defense of any of you. It's not a defense of anything that any of you might be up to. But there is a reality behind it. But as in everything else, notice how the reflection comes out of all the many, sundry, and from some viewpoints, rather curious rules that churches, sects, religions have of all the things you cannot do, that women cannot wear a dress two inches above their ankle. And you find hundreds of thousands of women and men that, yes, our prophet, or in some way our prophet translated some obscure scripture in the Old Testament, but that's what it says, and that's good enough for me. But that's a costume, and the costume has got them. How about another quickie? The kind many of you like, but the kind that all of you should be able to be compiling almost every day. Back to what appears to be the absolute complexity. Of course, you're seeing the complexity from one viewpoint as a major step. It's only good, you can only stand there for anywhere from an hour to a maybe 10 days, and then you got to move on of how life operates. Another one that continues to come to my attention, especially on the PBS television, the non-commercial network, shows on the pollution caused by the industrialization, let us say, of this country or parts of the world. And the hundreds and thousands, if not millions of people, sitting and looking at this and bemoaning the fact of this kind of pristine wilderness they may be showing for some example, and the kind of pollutions being created by the petroleum industry, for instance, and then not being able to be conscious of the fact that they would not be aware of this were they not sitting watching a television show that if you notice is sponsored by Mobile Oil through a non-commercial grant. They would not be aware that technology, so-called technological progress, is also destroying the planet were it not for the technological process, progress that has produced television and electricity, and letting them sit there in their chair and look at this and go, my, my. <laughs> At the ordinary level, even though it's not recognized, it is indeed a circular snare. And you see, well, now I can pull these out periodically. Some of you simply laugh at the time, and some of you are able to go further with it to realize it's not just funny. It's not in some way cynical. But those of you who can carry it any further should also have this continuing, now that I point out, awareness that ordinary consciousness cannot hold that awareness, not in you, not the ordinary level, and not in anyone else, no matter who they are, no matter how many degrees they have from Harvard. You may take them down and point out just what I did, and then go, yeah, ha, yeah, that's true. And it's gone just like that. And it's not just you, remember. It is them. It is ordinary consciousness that it can hear such things and go, ha, ha, or even sneer, go, yeah, ha, and it's gone immediately. There is no possibility, as they would say, I assume, in Alabama, of walking around awareness of this. That is, you, ordinary consciousness cannot become aware of these kinds of situations within the body of life and continue to operate and hold that awareness. It can't be done.
The last quickie for the night. Since I, in the last two weeks, pointed out that you could take the idea of three forces and absolutely ignore it and operate as though you had no knowledge, no opinion, no apparent understanding of there being three, quote, forces of some kind, that there would be three somethings, and then those other three modes that I had already pulled out, that there is something, instead of naming it, I don't know what it is, like three winds. But all three can be flavored. All right, in line with that, can any of you get even a glimpse that what I had heretofore referred to as D, that all of you thought in some way that that was fairly clear, as complex as it may seem to get when you try to bring in two and three all working together, but at least speaking one at a time, D, yeah. But can any of you get a glimpse of the fact that D could be seen as a force for change? That is, from what all of you assumed that I and erstwhile times had been referring to as C. Might I suggest to you that you ponder and neuralize what might be D in the kinetic mode? Let me further suggest to you without being specific that if you began to get some glimpse of this, and there are very, very specific areas within the history of humanity, including right now, that seem morally inexplicable, that seem almost beyond your present comprehension to fit in any of this of life growing, that there's some things that happen again, that surely the bad guys were about to take over. We just barely came out. <laughs> Can you try for me, when I say can you, to wrestle with the notion of a D wind in some kind of kinetic mode? Well, how about I'll give you one final, final quickie hint. Could you conceive of this kind of D something in a kinetic mode as being that which might really attempt not only the new, but almost the impossible, the frightening? I'll give you all right, one final hint. You must take into account parallel times. You must take into account the time frame of that which off time seems to be more obviously a C, a very, as you would think of it, good, constructive, worthwhile, beneficial, nothing wrong with, unconditionally approved of, something. And whereas this creature that I am suggesting to you might exist, somewhere in the unicorn universe that could almost be called D in the kinetic mode, you'd be talking about a different time frame. But that that which might attempt, that which might attempt to usher in not only something new, but something apparently impossible and something frightening. Now, if you will all turn to the second chapter of Genesis, we will... I've been around that gospel tent too long last weekend. A 
aside from humanity being driven to attempt a description of what it was struggling for, which of course is life's further completion, but beyond that being driven to put names on it, I suggest to you that the second most popular, the second most urgent activity that life has driven man to through the all-encompassing area of religion is the attempt to define this apparent split in himself. Even I had to deal with that. Even I have thrown out disposable maps, hence maps that apparently, if you followed them in a certain way, were self-consuming, then maps that apparently consumed that one right before it, and in good days, maps that apparently consumed those that did not even exist yet. But it's been this continual attempt, which you should find interesting in a particular way within itself, of humanity through religious, including philosophical, attempts to define himself in this splintered manner that there is a good part of humanity that is in me and everyone individually. There is this good part, and then there's this not so good part. There is this godly part, and then there is this ungodly part. Everyone including those in the minds, being ill-inclined to be philosophers, as we will all admit, everyone experiences this on a continuing basis. The further you get down in the minds and even down in the advertising blue level, they as we will all admit, everyone experiences this on a continuing basis. The further you get down in the minds and even down in the advertising blue level, they can laugh and joke and be sarcastic about it, but everyone is attempting to define what this division is. Uh, the time I started dealing with doing this on some public basis, some of the most common or one of the common ones was what they had picked up from Sufis and some of those Eastern schools of trying to describe in some way there was this false side, this shadow side of man, and then there was this essential side of man. That there is in some way a real part of us, and then there is some kind of false side to us. But by now all of you should be able to see that they're all talking about the same area that they're attempting to map, whether it be Christians talking about the soul of man or the whatever they would call it, the godly side of man and then the carnal side of man, or whether it be psychology trying to talk about the conscious, that is the self-profitable area of behavior and consciousness, and then the unconscious, wherein lies the swamps where we have picked up unprofitable signals and messages from our parents and our peers, and now we suffer over it and know not why all the way from that to believing that in some way man was a splendid, pristine creature and he's run amok. And there is this kernel of inside of him, this hidden treasure, wherein is perfection, wherein is total understanding. And by having lost our way, we've fallen into some state of sleep. We're all covered in mud now. And we wouldn't know the truth if we stumbled on it. It's all the same thing. I'm going to bring it up to date. And of course, as soon as I say it, it's almost outdated, but I'm going to give you closer based upon what you people have been through, what I've told you, and what you've experienced yourself. I'm going to give it to you closer. It is encompassed in my old equation of I plus not I that this feeling is quite real. At the ordinary level of consciousness, it is inescapable. Even those who do not talk about it, I assure you, down in the minds, still experience it on a continual basis. 
they can appear to be the least philosophical and reflective of people and they will say, I don't know what it is that makes me get out on the weekends and get drunk and run around on my wife. And they may laugh about it among their peers on Monday, but the experience is I shouldn't do this. There's some part of me that engages in unprofitable, as far as I can feel it, behavior. It has urges that I cannot control. It makes me do things. As that third great American philosopher, Flip Wilson, would have said, the devil made me do it. And then there's this other part of me that is not quite that bad. It's witnessed by the fact that I'm sitting here telling you that there are aspects of me that are not up to snuff. There are parts of me that are not decent. Let me give you a more up-to-date map based upon the kinds of things I have been trying to sketch for you and that you, through your own efforts, should be getting closer to. Try for the time being to map it out and to investigate and neuralize it yourself on this basis. That you in toto, of course by that I mean at the ordinary level of consciousness, not anything that you have done within the framework of this, but you are the totality of the voices in you. That's it. That is what everyone else throughout history has called the evil side, the carnal side, the artificial side, the unprofitable side, the unconscious side. It's every voice in you. And this other dreamed of side is one thing that I can describe for you people clearer. It is the voice of life. Of course, the voices in you are the voice of life, but you are talking about at the minimal level. You are talking about at the bare minimal level for humanity to serve its purpose of helping life become more conscious. So we're talking about, you remember my old line drawn through the brain, line level consciousness. Everything below that line every voice that was wired into you, every voice, the ones I have called public, the ones I have called private, the voices you approve of, the voices you disapprove of, that is you. That is what humanity has always looked at as being the unprofitable, the ungodly, the unconscious, the unacceptable. But then on the other hand, that which they dream of and that which many quite ordinary people experience to varying degrees, that is, God is talking to me. The gods are speaking to me. It's a very crude reflection. Of course, it will not get you anywhere, won't get them anywhere, and it certainly won't get you anywhere dealing with it. But those people that apparently speak with great conviction whether they say that it happens on a continual basis or these good old classical mystical experiences. I fell out for three hours and I saw everything. I just can't bring it back. I cannot re-experience it and I can't use it all. I can't even remember it all. But it was as clear. There was no mistaking what happened to me. That is all a reflection of reality. And they are quite right. They are quite proper to speak highly of it, to put great names on it and say there's no doubt the God spoke to me. I mean, there's no doubt. It wasn't me. It wasn't my unconscious voice. It wasn't the voice of the dark spirits talking to me. It wasn't myself talking to me. It was something else. It was life talking to them on a higher level. It was the higher energies of life speaking to someone. I'm going to leave this very crudely. I'm about to stop. But many of the questions that a lot of you 
and lukewarm moments still feel to be quite valid, and I treat them periodically as being valid. If you asking me, you asking yourself, am I doing such and such right? Should I be dealing with people here on a certain basis? Should I be acting in a certain manner that I am inclined to act with other people? Is that proper? Uh, am I within my rights to say, to speak in a certain way to people out in the ordinary world? Uh, if you want a quick, you can look at it as a week or take it for two or three day task as long as you can stand it. Go on back and be religious. Look at it as being the good side and the bad side, if you like that. The profitable side and the unprofitable side. There are two possible messages, there are two possible voices that you can hear. And one of them is you. And the other one is life. You hearing your voices, whether you be the Pope, the Chief Rabbi, the President, your own mother or father, somebody else's mother or father, philosopher or bricklayer, anything you have to say is what humanity has always been unwittingly referring to as being the voice of evil spirits, the voices of the unconscious, the voice of the unprofitable. That's it. But ordinary people under ordinary conditions have no real experience otherwise. They get little hints of it by being involved with religion. The churches and the temples and cults are full of people that on a good day would say, well, now, I don't believe that God's ever spoken to me. I don't feel like I ever had any kind of real great mystical experience. And I don't really question that our leader, my minister, my rabbi, my priest, uh, Swami X, uh, he infers or he says that he has, and I don't question it, and I don't even worry about it. There's something about attending the meetings, of going to the services. There is something that I can't get anywhere else. And once a week or twice a month, whenever I get around to it, it's kind of good, but I can't say that I've ever heard our God speak to me or the voices of the cosmos, whatever the Swami or somebody calls it, but it's almost as though I feel like I'm in a room where he might speak to us or she might speak to us. That I feel like that these might be the conditions wherein the voices of the gods might be talking. They might be whispering and I can't hear them yet. Or at least he may be talking to our esteemed leader You've got two things to listen to. You know, apparently, you give your grace attention to me, but you've got two things you're going to be stuck with listening to, is you and life. Of course, I did not make up any kind of new exotic terms, but that is it. When you hear something from this, from me talking, when you hear it, When you can hear it, you have heard something that was not you. That is the difference. But then it seems as though, as some of you have noted and some of you would like to lament, you have the wherewithal to have not done it in a real blatant manner, but why is it I can't, as you would put it, that I can't seem to get in touch with these voices or the voice? It seems like I'm dependent upon you to trigger it in some way, or you say something that seems to happen. What do you want? <laughs> All the stories about people saying that God talked to them, just note. If we refer that back to children playing on the playground, kindergarten, they're telling the truth. But once you can be conscious above the line, once you are not limited to the voices that are you, then you understand that God, in the sense they call it, God is talking to everybody. But he's mumbling. <laughs> and of course, back to my description. Life is speaking through everyone, but it's mumbling. 
It is saying only that which is minimally required to keep it going. It is like you having just enough of MV12 left that you just barely pass for being, by the ordinary definition, a conscious homo sapien. That I just barely, you know, I come in right under the wire. I just barely fit. That is the gr degree to which life speaks through and to men, except consciousness takes it as being a personal thing, except for the few people that finally come to the realization that this ain't me talking to me. If it is, why am I going to say next? Or why did I just say that? Which for a long time you can't even hold that in awareness. It just to the point that, yeah, that sounds right. But if this is me talking, what am I going to say next? If this is me talking to myself as I jog along here, the weather and the humidity is fine, pleasant day, my shins don't hurt, and I'm jogging along and just constant conversation going on, I'm talking to myself. Really? In that case, uh, who's doing the talking and who's listening? And what am I about to say next? What am I going to tell myself? Why did I just tell myself that? I've heard that before. I've told myself that. I haven't really counted, but I estimate 100 times a day for 40 years. I've told myself that same thing. Why am I not tired of hearing that? Why do I not turn to whoever it is that's talking to me? I say it's me and say, listen, I've heard all that. Don't you know anything else? <laughs> and of course, nay, nay, that does not happen. The reason is, it's not you talking. It's life mumbling. It is life being just barely conscious. <laughs> but at line level, that's true. Now, there appears to be a quantitative difference between that kind of constant mumbling, that repetition of that running static in you. You might think there's a difference between that and a man right now giving a learned lecture on the economic ramifications in the 20th century of uh, medieval uh, serfdom of the Anglo-Saxons people. You might think there's a difference. There might seem to be some kind of qualitative difference between that. But how did he know what he was going to say? And don't tell me he's reading a lecture. There's two choices. And they're quite simple, just like religion. I just take you back where you walked in here the first time. Just like religion, everybody believes there's good and evil. That's right. They don't know it. If you're trying to do this, there's good and evil. And anything you've got to say is the voice of the devil, if you want to go back and be simplistic. It is the voice of Beelzebub, Satan, the voice of the destroyer. If you consider the voice of boredom to be the voice of the destroyer, which I suggest to you that day will come shortly. But you've got two choices. And there is no qualitative difference in your voices, whether they are the public voice, the private voice, whether it's voices you approve of, whether it's voices you disapprove of. It all has the same source. It is the noise left over after the maximum amount taken out of the blood which is the minimal level of consciousness for life in humanity. What is left, you take as being you. So you got two simple choices, just like your parents told you. Either do good or don't do good. You either listen to the voices, you entertain them, you continue to accept it in some qualitative manner. And there is none. There's just two choices, there are only two possible sources, is life mumbling and life speaking. What this has always been is life speaking. It's true, as I've also put it, it's life also talking to itself out loud of what if. But it doesn't mumble, it speaks very distinctly. If you want one more, every time I do this kind of thing, I know it sounds complicated to some of you and people's face gets all screwed up. 
and there's no reason to do that if you belong here. Because as soon as I point out, you've got the running laboratory. Everything you need to know, every possible example, is there right this second. But the wrap-up little example I was going to give. But now all of you should have an awareness of this kind of absolutely minimal running static that passes for consciousness. Uh, it should be obvious, if for no other reason, I'll pull out an example, you are out jogging. And there's no particular blue circuit activity going on. You're not real upset, it's just a middle of the road day and you're out running. And then become aware of just this very low level, it's like a soap opera turned on, same crap over and over. It's just enough that if suddenly the guy had jumped out of the bush and said, are you conscious? You had to say, yeah. But the truth is, is yeah, but just, you know, I am running low octane. I mean, the set's just barely on. The picture's just barely in focus. I can barely hear the sound. But yeah, I was conscious, as opposed to being out and nothing getting up to the brain. That is the voice of life mumbling, that you can be jogging along, and if you had this kind of awareness, which all of you should know it's there, you don't need me to continue to tell you or to give you tasks, Let's say there are little low-level dreams you've had all of your life. You're running along wondering how many of the blinds that go by are noticing what cute buns you have in your shorts, or how many of them, on the contrary, are laughing at your real skinny little calves. And it's just, it's gone on all of your life, something of that variation. That is life's consciousness at the ordinary level. That's what I mean by the minimal amount. It's you talking to yourself, it's life talking to itself, but it's mumbling. It is at its most mechanical. Whereas what this is, where I get all this, where this has always come from, is in a sense, life's still talking to itself, but it's not this mumbling. It's not this same old crap over and over. It speaks very distinctly. It would be, to go back to my example of you personally, Let's say you are jogging along and you became aware of the fact, or you stop at a street corner, you have to stop the light to continue running, and a car goes by. Nice blonde headed girl, looks like she's about 17 or whatever it is that turns you on. And suddenly it strikes you. It doesn't matter what, but say, you know, very clearly, like, enough of this shit. I'm going to join the Y and I'm going to spend three hours a day doing nothing but working on my calves. Or perhaps it strikes you to look around and to think, it suddenly seems to strike you, fuck all this, who cares how my calves look? That you say to yourself, I'll never worry about this crap again. And whether you do or not, but it's like a sudden flash of, I'm not gonna do this anymore. I've had enough of this crap. Or, starting first thing tomorrow, I'm gonna do 2,000 toe raises every day. All right, it's still not a perfect parallel, but that is closer to what this is. It's not vague mumbling. It's life talking to itself, but it speaks very distinctly. All right, I'm gonna do this. And within one man's lifetime, such as mine, is everything life says it does do. In other words, I can't be proven wrong. Everything I told you life's going to do, you can count on it as long as you're alive. Didn't mean to confuse you anymore, but it knows what it's doing for a given length of time. It makes a decision, and it says, this is what I'm going to do. This is where I'm going. Going to hit some of the questions. This week's task, that is when I sent you out to compliment someone on a previously fictitious good deed they did, 
This week's task makes me wonder if anyone at the ordinary level knows their own power. Is it always a matter of waiting to be told, quote, you are kind or you are unkind? Is it that we know nothing internally until we are told? Is it that nobody has an internal knower until it is cultivated? It's a very potent observation. I could point it out this way, that life knows only, or a man knows only what life has told him. It'd be a matter of whether you can hear beyond the voice of you and hear closer the voice of life that I was just speaking of. I would hope that some of you see a relationship between the one I put on you on numerous occasions and gave you one sketchy way to look at it finally. Uh, why is it that there seems to be only power and externally acquired knowledge, specifically in axioms, proverbs, truisms, spiritual messages, that you can say you must love your neighbor and everybody, let's say on the planet goes, ah, that somebody somewhere says, there's only one rule, there's one paramount rule, you must love your fellow man. And let's say the whole planet goes, ooh, no doubt, no doubt about it. Why, I've asked you, could not somebody, just accidentally, the words just come together? And of course, I further suggested to you, somewhere along the line, in the neural molecular activity of people's brains, all over the planet, sometimes, somebody, the words came together, you should love everybody. But it meant nothing until this guy walked out and said, right, I'm going to tell you the most important thing, love one another. And everybody goes, wow. person put it another way based on their own observation. Is it a matter of waiting to be told? Is it true that we know nothing until we're told it? Let me refer you back right quick if you didn't get enough of that hint. Like the kind of rhetorical questions I were ask, was asking you. You can be hearing two voices, be hearing you and hearing something that's apparently not you. And why is it that no one notices the fact that the voice of you seems to have almost no significance whatsoever? That someone says the most important thing is love your fellow man. You go, I knew it, I, I knew it, I couldn't agree with it more. But it didn't seem to have any validity. Uh, you might even think, I've thought that before, but I don't know why it just didn't seem to have any real potency to it. From whence cometh enthusiasm? From whence comes enthusiasm? Well, to stay in line with the, what I was just saying, you could look at it in two possible ways. You could look at it as coming from your own voice, which would be life's minimal operations, or you could look at it as coming from life's voice, or at least a possibility wherein it would be a more intense message. All of you have had some feeling of there apparently being different kinds of enthusiasm. At least there are times that we're here on meeting night, or that I send you out on some task, but you seem to get enthused with some kind of enthusiasm that is singular. It's not something that you ordinarily experience. And of course, I did in the past take further pains to try and disavow you from getting involved with me, but it should be obvious, you know, it's not. Although I admit how charming and charismatic I am, you must suspect by now it is not just that. No, it's not just that. <laughs> it is a different kind of something from somewhere, is it not? I had several, some of you people are here, the tape later didn't know, but we dance normally after the meeting. And for the last two weeks I had people doing, in regards to the dance, we have a circle and then people take turns getting in the center of the circle and I had 
given directions that involve the muscles, the mind, and the respiratory system to go on with the dancing and a particular kind of singing. <coughs> and so, to bring you up to date on tape, or to give you a hint, but several people had observations that some of you would like to hear to put words on some of what you had thought. The dance of turning, breathing, and reciting the, what I told you to recite, is not unlike the effort of this thing in general. You can feel concentration get used up during doing things simultaneously. Concentration slice effort is not you doing something, but it's like a fluid under pressure. It can be forced to places. This is referring back to the task of last week of complimenting someone on a fictitious good deed they did for you in a department store, an employee. I just wanted to read the first part. The person points out, it shouldn't really surprise me, I guess, but I found it most interesting that someone would believe so bold a lie. <laughs> but now let me ask you, would these people so readily accept and believe a negative bold lie? <laughs> that if I had sent you in, which I'm not insinuating, don't do this, but if I had sent you in to go up to a person and say, listen, I've been steamed for the last two or three months, you probably don't remember it, but I tried to bring something back in here that wasn't working, and you gave me the greatest amount of grief that I've ever received from a department store, and I, I started to call or write the home office and to get your job. I didn't do it, but I'm still so goddamn mad, I just finally wanted to tell you, you don't deserve to work in public then see how readily they accept the bowl lie. <laughs> hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, oh, wait, no. I wasn't even working here then. What department? I just moved this department. No, I don't remember you. Remember, we're not laughing at somebody, but why is it that people will apparently so readily accept this kind of bowl lie of a certain form, in a certain mode? And I ask you if we had changed the form of it, would you have experienced such a readiness of acceptance of your bold lie? <clears throat> One feels the need to be with others, particularly the older members of the group, and simultaneously I feel the need, if not the necessity, of keeping out of each other's way. Any comment? Well, how about this? Once you can stay out of your own way, no problem. <laughs> For you newer people, that was not a flip comment. Here's why I just wanted to read. Obviously somebody from here in the group had looked at these tapings or some portion. Said the difference between you in person and on the tape is interesting. How big a part is played by the fact that the video of you is finished? Huh? But I also think if there is any interest, you know, 20 years from there, I'm dead. It's for new people to be able to look at that and think, boy, how great it is that we lived in modern times and I read some or heard about him and I can actually see him on tape. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, you do also understand, though, it will appear to be meaningful. Well, think how many of you, if you'd shown up here and I said, look, I got a video tape of Buddha talking, or at least an audio, or some Swami that died a hundred years ago. And I said, nobody knows this. It was one of the earliest wire recorders that somebody in the British service in India was just kind of fooling around and taped a couple of hours of great Swami so-and-so talking. Huh? It would have seemed very, assuming you'd had any interest at all in the person. Or if I just built him up as a famous person, that I said, well, who, who's your, who did you always want to meet? And you named some Swami or some guru, and I said, this is the guy that taught him. <laughs> and nobody knows it. This is the earliest recording of some great spiritual master. You would not have laughed. It would seem very meaningful. <clears throat> <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs>
I got a, two or three here that are just very good with no comment. Your suggestion slash hint that life may indeed be traveling in a straight line on another dimension set tingles all through my nervous system last Thursday. It is as though everything looks slightly different yet again. A little stickier, but listen. Last week, your name, or the naming of the substance in the blood and then telling us that the name, your naming the substance and then telling us the name was for me a good opportunity to see energy become form. At first, I was tempted to say that the mind, the yellow circuit, acts like white blood cells, like antibodies to anything new. But antibodies destroying invaders, and what the yellow circuit would seem to be doing is solidifying and putting a crust over new energy or unheard of information. It's as if, like, it is as if life is the ultimate bricklayer and is constantly whipping out new moving liquid energy. more than just that person's comment. Uh, I've done that on numerous occasions, but that was, could have possibly been taken as the most dramatic of letting it go over these number of years and then putting a name on it and telling you there was a name. It's notice that it does have an effect. I wasn't ever gonna tell you that, but at least I'll tell you that since I read that. A lengthy one that somebody that's been here some time. It seems that the newer people are having to move faster and are necessarily being subjected to more and more different kinds of pressure than the older members here. And that the resultant movement towards real growth is more jerky and uneven, almost like being out of phase of oneself for quite a while. Is there anything to this? I'm reading it. Is all of this part of what is meant by time and place? It seems that a lot of what you used to say directly and it linked to us, and it still seems to be a necessary initial basis for newer people to learn in order to get to the real starting point, it seems as though these things you no longer mention except an occasional, almost offhand, in an occasional, almost offhand way. Are we all at the point where the living example of the older group is serving a function that you used to have to perform directly? Very interesting. Is there such a thing as a, as a difference in the way men and women think? And if so, is it possible for either of them to learn the mode of thought of the other? The person put thought, but I am using it and I went ahead and read it, but I will assume, and you should, that they're using that in the broadest sense. It should be, is the general conscious awareness of men and women, mechanically speaking, different? If so, is it possible for either to learn the mode of consciousness of the other? In fact, if you don't do some of it, and you stay with some person here in the group, and you can't do that, then your attraction is of the minimal sort. The minimal sort. It may be good fucking, but it is of a minimal cohesiveness. I have heard music called the universal language, implying that music can in some way bridge gaps between people where words would fail. Yet man can dance to a certain rhythm and still no problems are solved. Yeah, but how about this? You can't re just routinely argue and suffer as long as you're dancing. <laughs> I mean, I, I was trying to make the best out of a bad situation. There is a reality, I will admit, what the person was implying, we'll assume, that in the way in which life says that through man, it is, we might say, overblown. 
to say it's a universal language implying, you know, as people do even now, you hear it in the last two or three years. In some way, if we get the whole world to listening to Judas Priest or the Culture Club, if we'd all get together and have Lionel Richie and the Earth, Wind, and Fire horns here, and everybody would get down and dance, then, you know, all the religious and racial wars and everything would stop. That's the implication. But back to the continual notion coming out through man that music is in some way universal, is based upon a reality. And the starting point I would give you, as I mentioned already, I'm not trying to make more out of music than you can necessarily get out of it, because although I don't like to dwell upon this, I don't even like to think about it personally myself, I'm aware of the fact that there are some of you here that music is not much more than noise to you. I just don't like to think about that. That's mostly humorous, don't be upset. But at any rate, what I point out is as far as human endeavors in the so-called creative areas, that music is singular in that it has the possibility to affect all three circuits simultaneously. Whereas literature does not, art does not, Dance does not, but you can take music, if you recall the one sketch I gave you one time, of there being a kind of song to life, of there being words, music, and rhythm. Then beyond an allegorical statement, music itself can affect, has the possibility to affect all three circuits. And starting at that being a minimal point, then it is universal that at any place on this planet they can be performing and other people listening to a form of music and it has the potential and it could be succeeding. Well, I'm talking about it on a mechanical level, but it can be affecting all three circuits. The words to the music, then that which seems to be the feeling produced by it, and then the wanting to get down or to at least, you know, pat your foot along. And there's nothing else, no other human, ordinary human endeavor you can do that to. You do not walk up to a Pollock painting and go, you know. <laughs> or you don't, you don't sit down and read, uh, you know, Whitehead or Bertrand Russell and go, wow, makes you want to get up and go, hey, hey. <laughs> There's a lot can be done with music, and as I assume I have inferred enough to you people, once we start something publicly, uh, several of the activities that I've had you involved with were not just ends unto themselves at that time, but I can assure you now, if you hadn't suspected it, that music will play a very large part. And some of it will be obvious, and some of it might be less obvious. But it certainly will because that is just, it goes hand in hand with what I was trying to point out to you or to get you to look at, of me saying that when it gets to a certain point of doing something publicly, whether I use the word religion or not, but the shell of what passes for religion is still the prime vehicle because it within itself through expected, through acceptable ways of people showing up somewhere, can it affect all three circuits. If I did do that, which I've you know, kitted around and asked some of you people to consider on your own possibilities, such as presenting this in some form out at public lectures and rented ballrooms and hotels, like how to be a more effective management, how to be a more effective manager in your position through you know, the EvoTech theory of thought. They will not come in and expect at the end of the evening or sometime through the evening, and by the way here we have James Brown, a new tape we have that just, it's not even on record, we want all you guys to, you know, loosen up your vest, take off your coats, and we're all gone. They will not participate. Religion, through, again, whether you use the word directly or not, It is accepted that you can affect all three circuits. Not all religions, of course, do it, not directly, 
they don't do it in the uh, most efficient manner. They're doing it in the most efficient manner to feed a certain segment of life's corporation. But there will be no limitations on what we do. And so they will very likely hear music. If some of you enjoy some of this gospel music that you heard in New Orleans, uh, other than our barnstormer, <laughs> I would point out to you the rest of it is fairly conservative to what we might be inclined to do. And it's going to be pushing it to what most people in this part of the world, or really most any part of the world, would really expect in a religious context. But once you get them in there, you can trick them and they'll sound all right. I do want to go ahead and make it a specific task that anybody, if you simply cannot come up with anything, don't, we're not playing kindergarten, don't hand it in if you just feel like you're just having to fake it. But I ask you again, it's been a while, anything from a sentence to a small treatise, tell me, what is it now that you think people want from religion? Don't listen to your voices. Try and look around and listen to life speak to everybody on this planet because to some degree everybody's religious. What is it that people want? <coughs> I've had one more hanging around for a while that I don't know whether to give to you or not. And so when I have any doubts, see, I tell you I don't know whether to give it to you or not, and then I just go ahead and say what it was that I haven't done yet, which I don't guess takes a genius to figure out that trick. If I had ever done it, it was to have you go up to businesses just on a continuing basis. I guess I told you to do it at least twice in a week, but this is one you can use forever until you'll see what the purpose is. It struck me probably the most common thing that different businesses would have in their mutual operations over the sideline. takes no education, no training, and I think they can have them put in with no investment that just makes a little money, and that is making keys. And so then, in a way that you would have to already prime yourself not to listen to your voices, not to even be prepared to entertain ridicule, hostility, you just got to understand that what I'm going to do is taking it beyond that realm, and I know that beforehand. They don't know it. I know it. And it is not an act of hostility. It's then find places, and there are only a few, I guess, that you could use, but such as you walking through a little strip shopping center and there's a bakery. You just simply open the door and say, do you make keys? <laughs> Or maybe a bridal shop. Just open your head, you know, the door and say, do you make keys? Or if it was convenient to walk by a place, if they were out in the public, like a mortuary, just open the door, do you make keys? You would have to find your own of what few places because you understand there's only a limited number of places that the feeling should be. If a guy got a little small bakery there, just big enough you can look in there, and there's nothing but donuts and flour everywhere. <laughs> and for some apparently reasonable person to open the door and say, do you make keys? <laughs> if I had told you to do it, so you've got to pick out beforehand, or you would have, See, all kinds of places would not take it that unusual, that it's possible. Or there might be a few places you picked that don't make keys, and as soon as you left, they might say, that's not a bad idea, we're to call. <laughs> but you've got to be able to pick out a place that the last thing in the world they would, would ever imagine was somebody to ask them, do you make keys? So you have to decide that beforehand. It doesn't take a genius to be able to do that. I think I picked out several good ones. A bakery I especially like. I don't know why. <laughs> but just a little small, like a mom and pop operation that they're obviously doing just one thing. And you look at it, 
And there's just no possibility that they would, not only did they not make keys, they never thought about it. And you got to understand that beforehand. And without me telling you anything else to look for, but you got to understand, accept that. And you've got to try and put yourself in their consciousness that they had never even thought about it, that their feeling would very well expect it to be when you left, or even maybe in your face, just look at you like, you know, I can't believe that you're asking me this. You've got to be prepared beforehand, and you've got to be able to do it non-hostily, but be prepared to get a hostile reaction, and be prepared not to listen to it, and not listen to your own voice's reaction to it. And then, just, you don't have to do it just once a week, or, like I said, it's you out, maybe you find your own. Don't make me think up anymore. If I think of them, I'll ruin them. I don't want to think about it. <laughs> but just you're suddenly in a shopping mall, or a little shopping strip, or a place, obviously, here is the very place to just open the door and look very concerned and interested and pleasant and say, do you make keys? <laughs> and wait and smile and be prepared. Very likely for just absolute hostility. Like, well, you fucking idiot. <laughs> yeah, I make keys. You, know, you, know, you want a cream-filled key? <laughs> you, know, you, want a, you want a chocolate-covered key? And then, then just say, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs>